Here we have a question on calculation of moment of inertia but with a twist. We are given a thin uniform rod and we are asked to calculate the moment of inertia of this thin uniform rod about the given axis of rotation. First of all, what do you mean by thin rod? It means that the area of cross section of this rod is actually negligible. What do you mean by uniform rod? It means that if you look at the linear mass density or the mass per unit length of the rod, all along the length it remains the same. Now, look at the axis of rotation. Is the axis passing through the center of mass? Yes. But is it perpendicular to the length of the rod? No. If it was, we know the moment of inertia for such a standard case. If the mass of the rod is given as m and the length of the rod is given as capital L, then it would be ml square by 12. If the given axis of rotation is passing through one end of the rod and perpendicular to the length of the rod, even in that case, we know that the moment of inertia happens to be ml square by 3. But this is different. The given axis of rotation is at an angle theta with the length of the rod. How do you go about it? Well, we have to go back to our basics. We have to consider a differential element of mass dm and length dx. Something like this. Let us consider this differential element to be at a distance x from the origin chosen, which also happens to be the location of the center of mass of the rod. Let's call this point O. And if we choose this to be the x axis, then the rod lies from x is equal to minus L by 2 till x is equal to plus L by 2. Now, we are given that the mass per unit length of this rod is a constant. If we call that to be lambda naught, then it is m by L. It's a constant. How do you find the moment of inertia of this differential element about the given axis of rotation? You write it as di equals this perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to the differential element square into dm, the mass of the differential element. But we also know from this triangle that r is x sin theta. Now, what is the expression for the mass of the differential element? How do you write it? Well, you write it as lambda into dx, linear mass density into the length of the differential element. But then again, we know that the linear mass density or the mass per unit length happens to be m by l in value. So, substituting that, we get m by l into dx. Now, substitute all these values into the expression here. R square will give us x square sin square theta. dm will give us m by l into dx. Now, how do I find the net moment of inertia of this rod about the given axis of rotation? We need to integrate. What are my integration limits? To consider that, we need to look at the rod. How is it built? We take the differential elements all the way from minus L by 2 to plus L by 2. What does that mean? We construct this rod by placing such differential elements, infinite number of them, all the way from x is equal to minus L by 2 till x is equal to plus L by 2. So, when we integrate, we write it like this. And our integration limits turn out to be minus L by 2 and plus L by 2 respectively. What is it on the left hand side? When we start from this end at minus L by 2, what is the value of moment of inertia we have accumulated? Nothing. Zero. But when we end up constructing this thin uniform rod, when we move to the other end, x is equal to plus L by 2, this way we have accumulated the net moment of inertia to be i. That's the interpretation of the limits for you. Now, let's simplify. 
we get on the left hand side i, on the right hand side m by l into sin square theta into x cube by 3 between the limits l by 2 and minus l by 2. Simplify this further by substituting the limits. You get i is equal to m by l sin square theta. This 3 can come outside. In the bracket we have l by 2 whole cube minus of minus l by 2 whole cube. Upon simplification, this turns out to be m sin square theta by 3l and here we get 2 times l cube by 8. Well, you can simplify this further and the final answer turns out to be ml square by 12 sin square theta. The correct option for this question is C. Next, we have a simple and straightforward question on perpendicular axis theorem. It says perpendicular axis theorem is applicable to option A, one dimensional object, option B, two dimensional objects, option C, three dimensional objects, option D, all of the above. Well, how do we define perpendicular axis theorem? If you take three mutually perpendicular axes, let's say x, y, and z, and let's say this planar body lies in x, y plane. Do you see that z axis is perpendicular to the plane of the body? If we define the moment of inertia of this body about the x axis to be, let's say, i x, about the y axis to be, let's say, i y, and about the z axis to be, let's say, i z, then perpendicular axis theorem says that they are related. And how exactly? iz will be equal to ix plus iy. But remember, this theorem is applicable only for planar bodies. So, which option is correct then? It is option B. We have yet another simple and straightforward question on perpendicular axis theorem. It says, Necessary condition for the application of perpendicular axis theorem, that is iz equals ix plus iy, where x, y and z axis are the axis of the rotation of the body is. Here are the options. First one, body must be two dimensional. Second one, x and y axis must lie in the plane of the body and z axis must be perpendicular to the plane of the body. Option C, x, y and z must be mutually perpendicular axis and option D, all of the above. Well, how do we apply the perpendicular axis theorem? What is the statement of perpendicular axis theorem? If you consider three mutually perpendicular axes, x, y and z, such that the body, the planar body is lying in the x, y plane. Do you see that z axis is perpendicular to the planar body? In that case, if you define the moment of inertia of the body about the x axis to be i x and about the y axis to be let us say i y and about the z axis to be let us say i z, they are related. The perpendicular axis theorem says that you can write i z to be i x plus i y. But remember, the body has to be a two dimensional one. So, to quickly summarize, the body must be two-dimensional, x and y axis must lie in the plane of the body and z axis must be perpendicular to the plane of the body, defined this way, and x, y and z must be mutually perpendicular axis. So, with all these things, let us look at which is the most appropriate option to choose. It is option D. All of the above are actually correct. Next, we have an application of perpendicular axis theorem. Let me interpret the data for you. We are given a thin uniform circular ring of radius r. What do you mean by thin? The area of cross section for this ring given is negligible. What do you mean by uniform? If you look at the mass per unit length all along the length of the ring, it remains the same. And its radius is given to us as capital R. Also, 
He says that the moment of inertia of this ring about an axis passing through the center of mass in the plane of the circle is given as I. Find the moment of inertia of the ring about the line passing through its center of mass and perpendicular to its plane. In other words, he is saying that if you take the ring, something like this, he is giving the moment of inertia of the ring about an axis passing through the center and in the plane of the ring to be I. Look at this. We are defining three mutually perpendicular axes x, y and z. We are considering the planar body, in this case the ring, to lie in the x, y plane itself. Do you notice that z axis in that case is perpendicular to the plane of the ring? If you define the moment of inertia of this ring about the axis x to be ix, about y axis to be iy and about z axis to be iz, we are given the moment of inertia of this ring about the x axis or y axis. Look at the symmetry. Why did I say about the x axis or y axis? Because both these axes pass through the center of mass of the ring and these axes lie in the plane of the ring. So, in other words, what we are given is Ix and Iy value. Perpendicular axis theorem says that Iz, Ix and Iy can be related as Iz equals Ix plus Iy. Now, we know what is Ix and Iy. They are simply equal to I in magnitude. So, Iz, which is a required moment of inertia about the axis perpendicular to the plane of the ring passing through its center, happens to be 2 times Ix or 2i. This is your final answer. The correct option for this question is D. Here is yet another example on application of perpendicular axis theorem. And let me interpret the data for you. We are given a two-dimensional lamina of arbitrary shape in the xy plane as shown in the figure. What are they doing? They are considering three mutually perpendicular axes, x, y, z. Do you see that the body lies in xy plane and the z axis is perpendicular to the plane of the body? He says that the moment of inertia of the lamina about x and y axis are Ix and Iy and their values are also given to us, which are 6 kg meter square and 4 kg meter square respectively. We are supposed to find the moment of inertia of this planar body about an axis passing through the point of intersection of these axes x and y and perpendicular to the plane of the body and he calls it to be Iz. Well, in order to find Iz value, we have to look at application of perpendicular axis theorem. Let me quickly explain what is it all about. We are looking at three mutually perpendicular axes, x, y and z. This body, this two-dimensional body is lying in the x, y plane. If we define the moment of inertia of this body about x axis to be i x and about y axis to be i y and about z axis to be i z, they can be related using perpendicular axis theorem. How? i z can be written as i x plus i y. And in this case, we know the values of Ix and Iy. They are 6 and 4 kg meter square respectively. So, substituting the values, we get 6 plus 4 kg meter square or 10 kg meter square. That's a required moment of inertia of the body about the axis passing through the point of intersection of x and y axis and perpendicular to the plane of the body. The correct option for this question is D.